It's about time to start our services this morning. I welcome each one of you. We have several visitors with us. Come and join us and invite you back at every opportunity that you have. Brent Richburg will be our speaker this morning. Looking forward to the lesson that he has prepared. At the evening service will be Mark Teal. We'll be studying Acts, the 10th chapter, and uh, looking forward to that study. I really don't have any new announcements. Uh, I remember Jill Golden and her brother is in pretty bad shape. They're giving him intensive chemotherapy and uh, the prognosis is not good. Let's remember her and her family at this time. Um, the rest of the list stays basically the same. Some have improved and some are still about the same, but let's remember each one of those that are on the sick list. At this time, if you would, uh, bow with me and we'll have a word of prayer and then continue with our service. Our dear righteous Heavenly Father, we come before your throne this morning at the start of this service. and We're just thankful for another day of life and all the many blessings that you've shared with us each and every day. May we not begin to take those blessings for granted and know that they come from your bountiful hand and that you care for each one of us and are concerned about each one of us and want the best for, for all of us that are your children. We ask that you be with all those that are on our sick list, those that are in the hospitals and the nursing homes, and that you would watch over them and strengthen them and be with their families in this time of, of a crisis and strengthen them. Let them know that you're near and that you love each one of them. We ask that you would be with Brent this morning as he presents his lesson, that he would have a ready recollection of the things that he studied and present them in a way that is pleasing unto you and we could benefit and learn from the study of your word and that we as listeners would open our minds and our hearts and allow those things to seek in and we would be a better Christian and draw closer to you in the days to come than maybe we have been in the past. We're thankful for our elders and the, and the oversight that they have. We ask that you continue to give them wisdom and, and strength to continue to lead this flock in the way that you would want it to go. We ask that you continue to watch over us, bless us as you see we're in need. God, guard and direct us and forgive us for our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
for the next song. 552. Seven hundred sixty nine. Thank you. 
Next song we'll sing is 426, page 426.
The invitation song will be number 922. 922. I also want to welcome everyone here. We have a large number of visitors. Uh, we're especially glad that you're here. I think it's the most visitors we've had in some time. So thank you for being here. We hope that each of you is benefited and edified by being here. I want to talk for a little while this morning about Christian leadership. And I want to give you a little, little background into... Well, Mark, it did it to me again. A little background into why we're going over that topic. I'm going to do that with a little bit of history, and then I want to talk about the structure of eldership, following elders, the qualities of elders, and training the next generation. If you remember, it seems like it's been forever ago, I think it was about March 8th was the last time that I spoke. It was before all the craziness broke loose. And I spent two services, it was long, and we went at it hard, talking about the history of the church. And we talked about how the church thrived and prospered in the early days, and then just 80 or 100 years after Christ died, that already the beginnings of falling away had happened. And as you go down through history, year after year, century after century, the church fell away. I mean, I'm not saying there weren't people that were following the Bible, but by and large, Christianity turned away from what its very roots were, the very foundation that Jesus had set up. And it began a departure. And here's kind of the lead into what I want to talk about this morning, what the departure started looking like. There was a continued move towards a hierarchy and a monarchical. It means one person being the bishop. It became common for the lead or head elder to move into a position of authority. Bishops of large towns began to exert authority over small towns. By 190, so think about that, Christ was crucified in about 33, so about 150 or 60 years after he was crucified, someone that had gone through this evolution was already claiming to be the universal bishop what led to the Pope. There was a priesthood that developed. The earthly establishment of the kingdom became a prime teaching of the church, and it led to all sorts of things in the Dark Ages where the church was out fighting wars. And that all seems so far away in the past. It seems a long ways away from anywhere we could get to now, and that's the way I want to keep it. <laughs> That's the way we want to keep it. We don't want to repeat past mistakes. We don't want to do things that people in the past have done that took them away from God. Remember, it was a short amount of time. It seems like forever to us, but there are people either listening on Zoom or here in person that can remember 80 years ago. And it can be in a blink of an eye. We don't want to be the ones that start the trek away. If you remember what started it all, it was valuing men's writings and men's thinking more than the Bible. That's what really started all the problems. You think about what starts our problems now, we start thinking we know more than the Bible and we don't count the Bible nearly as, as important as it really is in the way we should treat it. The second thing that happened was the breakdown of biblical leadership. A head elder or bishop began to take over. A clergy developed, and so there was this ruling class, as a, in a sense, that they began to take over. And here's what I want us to think about. All of this followed a period where everything was going great. And I'm not a gloom and doom sort of person. If, if anybody knows me, I'm generally optimistic, and I'm, I'm very optimistic. I think we're in a very good position. But what I want us to all think about, whether you are young the youngest person that can understand what I'm saying this morning, or whether you're older, we all need to do our part to make sure that the period of prosperity continues. So if you remember about two months ago, David Richburg, my son, spoke on the authenticity and reliability of the Bible. And I want to build on that. The Bible is the basis for everything we do. 
It's how we know how to operate. It's how we know how to live our lives. It's real, it's true, and it's made to be followed. And here's what the Bible says about leadership. It says it's vital. Leadership is vital to the church thriving, to the church being edified, to the church being built up. Ephesians 4 verse 11 says he, gave him, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, for building the church, for equipping the members to do what they need to do to be pleasing to God, to carry on the work of the church. The word pastor there, every other time that word's translated in the Bible, it's shepherd. And so there are different roles of leadership. It talks about teachers and prophets and evangelists. This morning in particular, we're going to talk about the role of shepherds or pastors or elders and what each of our role is, is in that, not just now, but our role into the future. Titus 1 verse 5 says this, as we talk about the structure, because that's what happened in history, things kind of broke away from that. Titus 1 5 says, for this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. I want to notice a couple of things out of that reading. And you're going to find, we're going to read a lot of scriptures this morning. I'm not going to be able to comment on every single thing. I want you to think about the things. I hope to give you some things to think about that you'll take them back and study, that you'll internalize these things, because it's, this isn't a today lesson only. It's a lesson for five years from now and 10 years from now and 25 years from now and 100 years from now. There were elders in every city. If you're like me and you grew up in Plainview, you've never known anything different than there were elders. But I lived and worshipped at three or four different places in some interim times where I lived, and some had elders and some didn't. And if you're visiting with us from another congregation, you may be from a place that has elders or a place that doesn't. A biblical premise of leadership, if we want the church to thrive, there needs to be qualified elders in every city. It's something we need to work towards. Every city. You also notice from this reading that there's a plurality of elders. It never was meant to be a one-man show. It's never meant for somebody to have the preeminence. It's always referred to as a plurality, more than one. Uh, you also notice that there's no hierarchy of elders or cities. So the idea that Plainview can exert authority over some other town around is found nowhere in the Bible. Short reading, short scripture, but if we stick to that and we remember that, it avoids a lot of the problems that happened way back when, when these very things began to happen. Maybe they happened for good reason. Maybe there weren't qualified elders in a small town, and so the big city thought they could help them. Anytime we try to help what God says and we don't follow what he says, it's going to end up being problems, either short-term or long-term or both. And so those are very basic principles about the structure of leadership. Ezekiel 33 and 7 is not talking particularly directly about elders, but it's talking about leadership in general. Uh, as Ezekiel was relaying God, what God had told, told him, he said, So you, son of man, I've made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. One of the principles of leadership since the beginning of time has been that of a watchman, to look out for people, to look, for, uh, look out for other people's well-being. 1 Peter 5, verses 2 and 3, and this is out of the ESV, here's what Peter said about being an elder. And we're going to go back and read this again, but I want to pick out a particular idea out of this, this scripture. Shepherd the flock of God that's among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, and I want to notice this particular phrase, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. The role of an elder is not to be a domineering monarch. The role of an elder, as it says here, is to shepherd and care 
to exercise over, oversight and to do it willingly for the good of the congregation. So here's the phrase I want to kind of remember. Elders are watchmen, not policemen. An elder's job is not to come around and smack you on the hand. And a lot of people get that in their head. I've, I've had it said to me in person, well, I guess I'll just take my licking now. And that's not the role of an elder. The role of an elder is to be a watchman. As we'll read some of the traits later on, the heart of an elder should be one of care and one of wanting the best for everybody. And as we read some of those traits and qualities in a minute, you'll see that idea shines through. And it just reinforces the idea of being a watchman, helping people, looking out for people, trying to prevent mistakes. The last phrase in that scripture says, being examples to the flock. And I, I've been in some kind of formal leadership position since I was about 25, when I didn't even really know what it was probably. Been to all sorts of training classes. And I'm not big on leadership books. I think the Bible provides a lot of leadership guidance. The principles in the Bible pervade all the good leadership books. But one particular guy uses a lot of biblical things is John Maxwell. And here's one of his repeated over and over quotes. Leadership is influence. You know, none of us follow somebody or we're less apt to follow somebody when they try to strong arm us. Strong arming doesn't work. Influence works. Influence works to make change. Influence works to help correct or to watch. And that's what the eldership is structured like. Not policemen, but watchmen that use their influence to guard and help and guide. First, Hebrews 13, verse 17 says this, Obey those who have the rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those that must give an account. Let them do so with joy, not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. We all have it in our hands to make it easy or hard. I remember back my sophomore year of high school, not one of my brighter moments, everybody has had a teacher that you knew exactly what it took to get under her skin. <laughs> and this happened to be, we're in a classroom over the breezeway at the high school. If anybody has gone to Plainview High School, there's a breezeway and you could do like this and the floor would shake. <laughs> and if you get about five or six, I was about 200 pounds at the time, you get five or six of us 200 pounds and we could all do like this with our feet under the chair where she didn't notice and pretty soon you could almost see her bouncing off the floor. We were undermining her authority. We were making it hard for her. And we could do that until she just would stop and dead. We all know what it looks like to make it hard for people to lead. And, and I don't want you to take anything. The congregation here is a, is a perfect example of how to do it right. So I don't want you to take it as a, as a lashing or a beating you over the head. I, I want to compliment you, but what I'm doing is let's make sure we keep it that way. Let's make sure that we let the leaders lead with joy. And I think something along this line has been said a couple of times in the last several months. Submission is voluntary. I can't make anybody submit. If any of you have tried to make your wife submit when you disagreed, you know how good it works to say, well, I'm the boss of you. <laughs> you, might, you might say it once, right? You won't say it twice. You know, you know how well it works with kids. Those of you that haven't raised teenagers yet, when, they're, when your children are little, you can say, because I'm dad and I said so. But at 13, that doesn't work so well. And at 25, it doesn't work at all, right? Unless you've got the influence that we've talked about earlier. And so I can't make anybody submit. That's voluntary. We choose to submit. But the thing about submission is it doesn't count until you don't agree. And as I say, the congregation does a great job, but that's the part of following elders. There's a flip side to that. First Timothy 5, verse 19 to 20. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear.
Jacob's not here, so this will probably come as a surprise to everybody but two people in the room. I don't always wake up in a good mood and cheery. <laughs> my dad believes that. My wife believes I'm not sure my mother believes that. <laughs> but my, my wife and, and my dad do. Jacob would tell you that's for sure true. And all of you that are related to an elder know that we're not perfect people. You know, one of the qualifications of being an elder is not being perfect. There are a lot of traits to have, and there are going to be mistakes made. And sometimes they're really bad. And there's a process for that. If you think in history what happened is a small group of people got power and power and just kept getting more and more power. Well, that's not supposed to happen either. And so there's a process in place. When that happens, uh, there's a place and a way to take care of that. I didn't write this down, but for 1 Timothy 5, verse 1, talking about younger to older in general, but the, the principle is very true. Because what we as elders want, what I as a manager or a leader in my organization want, is for people to be able to talk to each other, for me to be able to talk to the leaders, them to be able to talk to me in a way that's productive. 1 Timothy 5, verse 1 says this, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a brother. That portrays more of an attitude than anything. Rebuke means to bring an accusation or a railing accusation, to come up with an argumentative spirit. In treatment or being entreating towards somebody is exactly the opposite of that. Being entreating means I love you and let's have a conversation. Let's talk about things. Because guess what? I'm guessing there's probably 225 or 30 people in person, maybe another 50 on Zoom. Any given time, 300 people. And how many opinions do you think there are among 300 people about lots of different things? Probably 300. Because we've all come to our own reason, reason for a lot of different, from a lot of different directions. But when we can have the attitude of being entreating towards each other, then we can understand differences. We can work out differences and things work out um, in the middle of how it's supposed to be open communication and dialogue. So as we talk about following elders, here's how I kind of want to wrap that up. It's not a ruling class. It's not a group of people that are untouchable. It's exactly the opposite. It's a group of people that should be very relatable, very touchable. And we'll read those traits and those qualities in just a little bit. There's a process for correction. There's a way to talk to people, elders, and, and bring about change and understand what's going on. And ultimately, we're all joint heirs. We're all joint heirs of what Christ has offered us. He's offered us salvation, and we're all going to get the same salvation. That's what we're all striving for. Nobody is here and here. As we talk about the qualities of elders, I want you to keep a couple of things in mind, because after this slide, we're going to read about four different readings, and there are several verses each, so I'll encourage you to follow along or open up a Bible. Here are some things about the qualities of elders and the job of being an elder. It's a job to be desired, and we'll talk about what that desire means. We want it to, you want it to be a desiring of the responsibility and a desiring of the work, not the recognition. And it's people that exhibit certain qualifications or traits. And I want you to think about these, this as we read through them all, because I've always thought about the qualifications or the qualities or the traits, whatever you want to call them, in my mind sometimes, and, and we all like a checklist. And so I want to make a checklist, and I want to say check, 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 oh, no check, check, X, no check, and see how it, somebody stacks up. And so all of us are in different spots. There are elders in this room. There are people that are going to be elders. There are people that are so young, they don't know if they want to be an elder or not. And all of us, as we read through these traits, I want you to think about them not as a checklist, but as a way to develop your character, a way to develop the way that you think, the way that you build your influence, the way that you build your biblical knowledge, the way that you do a lot of things as we read about them. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to read the first seven verses. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. 
A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man doesn't know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. We're not going to go through word by word or phrase by phrase and define all those things. I just want you to think in general about some of those. The traits they have, temperate, even, even-headed, sober-minded, able to think clearly, good behavior, hospitable, loves people, able to teach, not a drunkard, not given to wine. Think about, as you read through all of these things, isn't that the traits that we all want to have? Isn't that someone who their influence would be a good influence on us, that we could be led by their influence? And if you're not an elder, as we read through these things, don't think about it as an unreachable skill that you can never have. We're going to talk about desire and what that means as we talk about training the next generation, but you can have those traits if you want them bad enough. What you can't do is say, I want to be an elder and I want to be just like I am because we've all got room to grow. In Titus 1, verses 5 through 9, it goes through many of the other, the same ideas in a different place. And we read the first verse of this already. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what's good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. You see many of the same ideas. Building a biblical foundation, building a character that will be able to influence people for good to follow God. Nowhere in there does it say an elder's perfect. Just in case you wonder, you can still ask my wife. She'll tell you that that's not true. <laughs> and I bet you could ask Vicki and she'd say the same thing about Mark. And we could go down the list. And so for many of us, we think, well, this is an untouchable thing. Elders are untouchable. They never got hit on by mistakes because they didn't make any because they're all set up and good now, right? Well, it's exactly the opposite. We've been beat up by life just like everybody else has. And what our job is to try and use our skills, our biblical knowledge, our influence, to try and prevent that as much as we can from anybody else. And if you want to be an elder, if you want to be an elder's wife, that's the skills that you can develop. These very skills right here. Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 31. Paul talking to a group of elders. Therefore... Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. You know, many times leaders of organizations begin to think the organization is theirs. The church belongs to God. Jesus purchased it with his blood. Elders are just helpers. We're overseers to help shepherd it. And he warns them, for this, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. 
Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn night and day with tears. You know, I always find it very interesting, and there's plenty of influence from the world, and we have to be on guard from the world getting in on us. But you know where all the warning comes from, the elders to look out? To look out, because things are going to rise up from inside. Wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. People will try to draw those away from themselves. It's something that can't be overlooked. First Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Here's what Peter said about elders. The elders who are among you I exhort. I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that's among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Through those four fairly lengthy readings, you see the vast, it's not a checklist, but it's the character that we want to develop in leaders. The character we all want, but the character that leaders must exhibit if we're going to stay true to what the Bible tells us. Think about, and this is just my summary of, of what these traits all speak to, biblical knowledge. You know, how do you know to, how to warn people or protect when people come in teaching false doc, doc, doctrines if the elders don't know the Bible? How can someone be respected and be a good influence if you can't look and see a godly life? Not a perfect life, but a godly life. Blameless doesn't mean no mistakes, but blameless means someone can't accuse you of being a sorry person. Many of those are attitudes. Can you think about those that are constantly pessimistic and those that never have a good word to say? That's not the, t the, the traits that the Bible points out for elders. It's someone that can give someone and be a positive influence on people. Many of them had to do with experience. You know, there are just some things at 54 that I know that I could not know at 25. I hadn't experienced it yet. And somebody could have told me to look out for it, but I still not the same as experience, right? Raising kids is a great example. The poor first child that you wonder how they survived because they were going to be the perfect one. <laughs> And by the time they got to be teenagers, you realized a lot of times you were learning on the fly. Even when you read the Bible, even when you had good examples to follow, even when you talked to people about raising kids, there are some things you just didn't know. And that's the way it is with life in general, isn't it? That's why it says not a novice, among other things. You need elders that have experience. I wasn't exactly sure how to say this, but a track record of success. And I don't mean success in a way to pat yourself on the back, but when you can look at someone's life and see, well, their kids turned out pretty good versus, man, they never made their kids mind at all. That's, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. And so evidence speaks louder than just people wanting something. All of these are traits and characteristics to build. Without throwing anybody under the bus or giving away the secrets, I think it's important to kind of give you a real life example. Because when you get leader, and here's why. A lot of times I grew up thinking my parents never disagreed about anything. And I'll promise my kids don't think that about Leslie and me. But it was a skill I didn't have was knowing that, hey, we, everybody just can get along all the time. And it all was just peachy keen all the time, right? Sometimes you have to understand it's not all just peachy keen. And that's when the traits and the skills and the characteristics that we just read about 
that's when they really, really become important. So I'm not going to name names. I'm just going to give you a generic scenario. But as you can guess, if you know all of the eight elders, we were all in eight different positions about lots of things. <laughs> when it came to mask and where we're going to sit every other pew and where we're going to Zoom and we're going to do all these different things. I mean, just think about all the different people. You know all of us from some, most of you for 20 or 30 years. You can see we all came from different positions on that. The other thing you know about all of us, there's nobody that's very, oh, what's the right way, non-stubborn. <laughs> Just ask their wives if you wonder. <laughs> and so there were some heated discussions. I can speak for myself, and probably sometimes I said things I shouldn't have said in a way I shouldn't have said them. But you know what happens when you have men that have been selected because of those traits, we're able to step back and go, we need to figure out how to make this work. And guess what? It's working. Now, could things be different? Sure. We might come with a different decision later? Sure. And you know, you can think about that in your own, when you're married. Sometimes you disagree and you have to step back. But if you go back to the basic principles and characteristics of what elders are supposed to be like, conflict and controversy and disagreements, we can step to the other side of that and come out better than we were before. And so these traits and these skills and these attitudes and gaining the experience and the knowledge, it's not a checklist. When it gets down to the heat of the battle, when you're in somebody's house and they're having marital problems, when you're with someone and their kids have gone off the deep end, or when you're trying to decide what to do with coronavirus and people aren't on the same page to start with, guess what has to happen? Those traits have to shine through. Those traits have to win in the end so that, guess what? We don't want to repeat past history. We don't want one person domineering. We don't want it to be one person's idea. We don't want it to be all the things that began the church departing. We want it to be what the church is supposed to be and how leaders are supposed to lead. And those traits are real life. They're ultimately important. Being temperate, being sober-minded, being of good behavior, being stewards of God and seeing yourself that way, not being self-willed, not being quick-tempered. You know, great traits for all of us to have but extremely important when there's differences in controversy or potential controversy. Some other things about elders and qualities of elders. And these are real life things. I'm not just making them up because a lot of times people think they're inherited. Just because it's a child and a father or a family doesn't mean they're not qualified, but it's not a default. My dad was an elder, so I'm an elder and I'm destined to be one. It shouldn't be an attitude if I put in my time, and so I should be an elder. And maybe we haven't seen it here. I've seen it in other places. I've seen it in other churches. Not my turn in line to be an elder. It's not a lifetime appointment. And haven't spent a lot of time talking about wives, but I want to read one verse about that. 1 Timothy 3 and 11, and it's kind of sandwiched in after talking about qualities of deacons, but when you read most commentaries or most general thought, it applies to the wives of both. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Wives are a great asset or exactly the opposite to leaders. And a leader can't be effective without a godly wife, without a wife that adds to, not subtracts from, the old benefit of the overall time and skills that the elder has. I think it's more and more true, and it will be as we go forward. Men started being sorry 50 years ago, I'll say, before my lifetime. Men were doing sorry things in. Women in general, all the ones I knew, they were pretty nice people because social pressures taught them to be nice. Maybe their families taught them whether they were in church or not. As time has gone on, well, now women are kind of catching up, and a lot of them are about as sorry as the men, right? <laughs> 
And how good, how effective can I be? I can be somewhat effective helping a, a woman know how to raise her family and how to love her husband. But how important is that there's a, a wifely influence or a woman's perspective on helping people that are struggling with being a wife be involved in that? Doesn't mean they're an elder, but if you're not male, it doesn't mean you're off the hook and you shouldn't develop your leadership skills as well. The wives of elders and deacons are very, very much needed and are very, very important. They're a partner, they're a support, and they're an influence on all the people that they meet. I want to spend the last bit this morning talking about training the next generation. It's a sobering thought. Some of you saw it on Facebook or saw Leslie. I'm, I kind of keep quiet. Today, I've been married 34 years. It just seems like yesterday. And here's the fact of the matter. None of us like to think about it. I guess Gerald is the oldest elder, and you can work your way all the way down to Craig, who I think is the youngest. The fact of the matter, every single one of us is going to die. Every one of us. We're not going to escape it. None of us wants to think about that. It's not a pleasant thing to think about, but it's a fact. And so training the next generation is ultimately one of the most important things that we can do. Proverbs 13, 22 says this, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, to his grandkids. And maybe he's talking about money, but we all owe it to our children, whether they're, I'm 54 and I'm somebody's child, or 25, which is how old Jacob is if he was here, or three months, which is how old Charles is if he was here, I owe it and you owe it we all owe it to all those generations, our children's children, our grandchildren, to leave them a godly inheritance. And if we're not teaching and training, and it's way more than reading these Bible verses to your kids, it takes training as well. If we're not training up the next generation to fill these roles that every one of us is going to be gone, then we're doing ourselves an injustice. And so let's talk a little bit about training the next generation. You probably heard this phrase another way. When's the best time to train an elder? You probably heard, when's the best time to plant a tree? 25 years ago, right? You know what the second best time is to train an elder or plant a tree? Today. Today. And so I encourage you, wherever you're at, old, young, Let's develop ourselves. And part of my job, part of our job as elders is to train and offer opportunities to our replacements. Because no matter how much we don't want to think about it, we're all going to be replaced one way or another. And I, and I want to throw this in there as well. You can be a good Christian without being an elder or deacon or a wife of one. It's not for everybody. And so if that's not your desire, not what you feel like you need to do, you shouldn't feel bad about that. That's not my intention at all. But still, you can teach your children. You can develop leadership skills that can be used for a lot of good reasons. We read this first just a little bit earlier. I want to read the second half of that. It says, let them do so with joy, not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. I think there's a mindset that somehow being an elder is all bad and hard work and no fun. And I won't say every minute is roses and everything is great all the time. But you know, the Bible itself said the work of being an elder can be a joy. And so I want to inspire some of you to realize being an elder can be a joy. And as you develop skills and experiences and add these traits to your life, the responsibilities that come with it can become a joy, not a drudgery. We read this one. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Emphasis on the work, not the recognition. And here's why I think that's important. 
as you're younger, all the way from a babe, all the way up to middle-aged, desire produces motivation. If I want something bad enough, I'll do what it takes to get there, right? If I want a million dollars, or if I want a successful business, I work long hours and study up so I can make a lot of money. Well, if I want to be an elder, that will bring the motivation to me to develop the skills needed to be an elder, to develop the experience needed to be an elder. It's not for the recognition, but guess what? The perseverance needed to develop those skills sometimes is thankless. Sometimes you're doing work that nobody notices. Sometimes you're doing things that nobody else wants to do. Sometimes nobody else even knows that it's work to be done. And if that becomes a drudgery to you, then being an elder won't be something that can be joy because not everything's standing up in front of the crowd and, and the positive things. There are some hard things, but when you develop the skills, it can be a joy. And so if you don't desire it, you won't develop the skill because sometimes the skills aren't that much fun to develop. You need to accumulate the knowledge, attitude, and experience necessary to meet those traits. So I'm gonna kind of go through some things, maybe starting with those that are younger. How can we teach younger kids to be leaders? I'm guessing a five-year-old, the last thing on their mind is being an elder. But guess what, as parents, as grandparents, we can influence their ability to do that or not. And the first thing I think we do is teach our kids and grandkids how to serve. And the way we teach them to serve is by being a servant. We can tell them to go do stuff for people, but when we take them to go do stuff for people, guess what they learn? How to be a servant. We can teach our children to love the church and not just this inanimate group, the church, but all the people in the church. When we teach our kids to love the people in the church, it becomes worth it, the extra effort it takes to do things for people in the church, because you do things for people you love, right? And if our kids hear us saying good things about people in the church and see our attitude of loving people in the church, they're going to love people in the church. Unfortunately, the exact opposite is true. When we complain about the people at the church or we have bad ideas or thoughts about the people in the church, guess what our kids learn? We want to teach them to love the church and all of us, all the people in the church. Sometimes it's not easy. Parents, and there's a fine line between supporting and pushing your kids towards service and excellence, especially when they hit about 10, at least boys. Sometimes when they're old enough, I had one child, eventually I guess it got through, had one child that liked to work as hard as they could to do the least they could <laughs> and still make an A because otherwise he wasn't going to get to do his stuff, right? Sometimes you have to push, and kids are all different, but we as parents have to look beyond what our kids know and what they think, and we've got to teach them to strive for excellence and to strive for service and to learn to do things that they don't get a reward for. And we can say all we want about this, everybody gets a participation ribbon and how long that's been going and all the problems that that develops. But ultimately, who teaches them to do things without getting a reward? And that's us as parents and grandparents. And if we teach our kids that, guess what? They'll be ready to do the work when the work's there, when they get older. Not just at church, not just when you're with other Christians, when you're at church activities, Seeing a nursing home doesn't have to be an organized church activity. You can volunteer. I know people here that volunteer putting meals together at the, the food bank. People that work at the animal shelter. doesn't have to be some great thing, but it teaches kids to do something that they're not getting recognized for. Doing something for somebody else. Mow somebody's yard. Take somebody food. There's, all, there's any number of things that are outside the box to think about somebody besides ourselves. And when we teach our kids that, it's a whole lot easier to have adults that think that way, right? If you're older than that, teenagers. Sometimes we think teenagers, it's our job to make our parents and our teachers' lives hard. And I know none of y'all are like that. I'll, 
I was only like that with that one teacher that was above the breezeway that we could make the room shake. But sometimes as teenagers, it's hard. We're trying to exert our independence. But as you're developing more independence, put yourself in places to learn. Put your, yourself in places to serve. The world doesn't revolve around you. It didn't when you were eight. It doesn't when you're 15 or 18. It doesn't when I'm 54. The world doesn't revolve around us. And the sooner we can learn that in a positive sense, the more we're able to serve other people. Learn the Bible. You don't just wake up one day and know the Bible. When you're old enough to read and understand the Bible, learn all about it that you can. You can't just decide when you're 50, okay, I'm going to learn the Bible now, and so I'll be ready to be an elder in two years. It's a lifetime accumulation. You're learning what you can learn at 12 and what you can learn at 15 and what you can learn at 25 all the way through. Keep adding and adding. Work in groups. Most of y'all probably had the same experience I did. And you say, why in the world are you saying group work? Because it, it taught me a principle that I didn't learn until probably way too late. I hated group work. Because you know what? It, it always seemed like I was in the group with the guy that didn't do anything and the girl that wanted to look good and do anything. And then guess who got to do all the work? Seemed like I got to do all the work. And then guess what? I got a worse grade than if I'd have just done it myself because we divided up the grade. And probably everybody's had an experience with group work that they hated. And everybody said, well, I'd just rather do it by myself. Try to use it as an opportunity because you know what? Leadership is a big group project. <laughs> I didn't know that when I was 15. And guess what? The skills learned to motivate people and to encourage people and to support people when you're 15, those are many of the same skills that as you develop them, are needed to support people when they're 50 and 60 and 80. Put yourself in positions to learn. Be an informal leader. You know how you're an informal leader? At the end of basketball practice, when the balls are scattered all over the court and there's 50 of them laying everywhere and there's a basket over here and the manager is picking up the balls by herself or by himself and you just got through running sprints and you're tired, Guess what a leader does? Goes and helps the manager pick up the balls. Because leaders are willing to do what other people want sometimes. And the earlier you learn that and as you practice that, it puts you in a position. And you don't have to have a title to do that. Plan and organize things not expecting recognition. Even if it seems like you're doing all the work. Be supportive of authority, not just authority at church, but the authority at home or at school or at work in the community. If you're a parent, lead and develop your home. It's your best training ground. And it may seem strange when you have little babies. Leadership's not about control. If control is your leadership technique, it's of limited value. Nobody likes to be controlled. They need to be influenced. And so be careful. If you find yourself always the one trying to be in control, take a step back and learn how to use influence. Leaders see what others don't see and are willing to do what others won't do. Keep that in your mind as you're growing up, as you're maturing, as you're developing. As we finish up, Hebrews 13 says, Remember those who have the rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Leadership is influence. It's critical. It's crucial to the success of the church. And imperfect people following God's plan will work. I hope you'll take these things, however old or young you are, that you'll internalize them, that you'll put them to practice, that when I'm dead and gone, or Mark's dead and gone, or go around the room of the elders, when we're dead and gone, that there are people equipped and ready and skilled to take our position. The church depends on you. If there's some way that we can assist you this morning, we haven't spoken on the first principle, we would love to help you enter into the kingdom through baptism if you've been previously taught, or if there's someone here that needs assistance of the church through prayer, please come while we stand and sing.
What a blessing we've had to be able to come out and hear a portion of God's word. At this time, we come around the table to remember what Jesus has done for us. If you did not pick up one of the uh, baggies with the Lord's Supper, would you raise your hand? We have somebody that can bring that to you. We think about what Jesus came here for, a plan that was set in motion from the beginning. We think about his life on this earth, his example that he gave to us. The suffering that he went through. In Isaiah, it says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Because of Jesus, we can be forgiven of our sins. And as we partake of this bread, which represents his body, and the fruit of the vine, which represents his blood, think of what Jesus did for us, his sacrifice, the stripes that he took for us, for us to be healed. If you would bow yourself at this time as we pray for the bread. Father, we come to you. We pray that as we partake of this bread, we remember Jesus, his death on the cross, his broken body. And Father, we pray that we always remember what he's done for us and that we, that we can pull our minds and to remember his love for us. Pray that you bless this bread. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
the fruit of the vine, which represents his shed blood. In 1 Corinthians 11, 25, and this cup is a New Testament of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you pray with me at this time? Father, we love you so much. We realize what Jesus has done for us. Thank you for this fruit of vine, which represents his blood. His blood that cleanses us of our sins, makes us whole in your sight. We pray that you bless it. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. Another duty we have on the first day of the week is to lay by so that the work of the church can continue. We have the boxes by the four exits of the building. If you did that before, you can do that after service. That we can continue the work that around the world support the evangelists that are out preaching the word and the work around Plainview. I'll turn the services over to the other brother. Thank you again for being here, especially you that are visiting. We ask that you please consider coming back again and, and join us. Remind you of our service this, this afternoon, six o'clock, uh, Acts chapter 10. I always find that special because being a non-Jew, like probably the most of the rest of you, this is where the, the gospel was introduced to those that weren't Jews. And so Brother Mark Teal will be leading our study for that, and let's prepare to, to, to learn some more about the history of the church. Don't have any further announcements. I'll ask uh, Brother Luke Miller, if he will, to lead us in a closing prayer, and then Carl will have a closing song for us. If you need to leave early, you're welcome to do during that song. Please stand. Please pray with me. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to you at the, at the close of this service, thanking you for this day, thanking you for this time and opportunity we've had to get together and worship you this morning. We're uh, hopeful that, that everyone here has, has been lifted up and edified. We're thankful for, for your word that we've been taught this morning. Please help us to uh, take those things and and apply them to our lives. Help us to help us to identify those areas uh, in our own character, or our own lives, where we can improve and and strive to improve those things. Please uh, be, continue to be with those who are are sick, those who are who are mentioned, who are uh, dealing with health issues or um, trying to to recover. Please uh, give them a portion of their health back, if it be your will. Please be with others uh, who have lost loved ones. Help comfort them and help them to look for you to help them to look to you for guidance during this time. Please be with us as we leave here. Please uh, be with those who are traveling. Please keep them safe as they get to their destination. 
and help us to do your will in all things. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 591. 591. As you're turning there, I, I chose this song today. Uh, it seems like we have lots of turmoil in our country today, and we got to always remember countries have risen and fallen in turmoil since the beginning. We don't know what tomorrow holds for this country, but we have today. I want to lead the first and the fourth verse, and let's think about this and, and how we count our blessings. <laughs> 